Bird in the Hand It's not a rock, said Ra Chen. The bird looked stupidly back at them from behind a thick glass wall. Its wings were small and underdeveloped. Its legs and feet were tremendous, ludicrous. It weighed three hundred pounds and stood nearly eight feet tall. Other than that, it looked a lot like a baby chick. It kicked me, Svets complained. A slender, small-boned man, he stood stiffly this day, with a slight list to port. It kicked me in the side and broke four ribs. I barely made it back to the extension cage. It still isn't a rock. Sorry about that, Svets. We did some research in the history section of the Beverly Hills Library while you were in the hospital. The rock was only a legend. But look at it! Svets's beefy, red-faced boss nodded. That's probably what started the legend. Early explorers in Australia saw these ostriches wandering about. They said to themselves, If the chicks are this size, what are the adults like? Then they went home and told stories about the adults. I got my ribs caved in for a flightless bird. Cheer up, Svets. It's not a total loss. The ostrich was extinct. It makes a fine addition to the Secretary General's vivarium. But the Secretary General wanted a rock. What are you going to tell him? Ra Chen scowled. It's worse than that. Do you know what the Secretary General wants now? People meeting Ra Chen for the first time thought he was constantly scowling, until they saw his scowl. Svets had suspected Ra Chen was worried. Now he knew it. The Secretary General was everybody's problem. A recessive gene inherited from his powerful, inbred family had led him with the intelligence of a six-year-old child. Another kind of inheritance had made him overlord of the earth and its colonies. His whim was law throughout the explored universe. Whatever the Secretary General wanted now, it was vital that he get it. Some idiot took him diving in Los Angeles, Ra Chen said. He wants to see the city before it sank. That doesn't sound too bad. It wouldn't be if it had stopped there. Some of his circle of advisors noticed his interest. They got him historical tapes on Los Angeles. He loves them. He wants to join the first Watts riot. Svets gulped. That should raise some security problems. You'd think so, wouldn't you? The Secretary General is almost pure Caucasian. The ostrich cocked its head to one side, studying them. It still looked like the tremendous chick of an even bigger bird. Svets could imagine that it had just cracked its way out of an egg the size of a bungalow. I'm going to have a headache, he said. Why do you tell me these things? You know I don't like politics. Can you imagine what would happen if the Secretary General got himself killed with the help of the Institute for Temporal Research? There are enough factions already that would like to see us disbanded. Space, for instance, they'd love to swallow us up. But what can we do? We can't turn down a direct request from the Secretary General. We can distract him. They had lowered their voices to conspiratorial whispers. Now they turned away from the ostrich and strolled casually down the line of glass cages. How? I don't know yet. If I could only get to his nurse, Ra Chen said between his teeth. I've tried hard enough. Maybe the Institute for Space Research has bought her. Then again, maybe she's loyal. She's been with him twenty-four years. How do I know what would catch his attention? I've only met the Secretary General four times, all on formal occasions. But his attention span is low. He'd forget about Los Angeles if we could distract him. The cage they were passing was labeled Elephant, retrieved from the year 700 Antiatomic, approximately, from the region of India, Earth, extinct. The wrinkled gray beast watched them go with sleepy indifference. His air of inhuman age and wisdom was such that he must have recognized Svets as his captor, but he didn't care. 
Svets had captured almost half of the animals in the vivarium, and Svets was afraid of animals, especially big animals. Why did Ra Chen keep sending him after animals? The thirty feet of lizard in the next cage. Gila monster, the placard said, definitely recognized Svets. It jetted orange-white flame at him, and flapped its tiny bat-like wings in fury when the flame washed harmlessly across the glass. If it ever got loose. But that was why the cages were airtight. The animals of Earth's past must be protected from the air of Earth's present. Svets remembered the cobalt blue sky of Earth's past and was reassured. Today's afternoon sky was brilliant turquoise at the zenith, shading through pastel green and yellow to rich yellow brown near the horizon. If the Chinese fire breather ever got out, it would be too busy gasping for purer air to attack Svets. What can we get him? I think he's tired of these animals. Svets, what about a giraffe? A what? Or a dog? Or a satyr? It's got to be unusual, Rachen muttered. A teddy bear. Out of his fear of animals, Svets ventured. I wonder if you might not be on the wrong track, sir. Hmm. Why? The secretary general has enough animals to satisfy a thousand men. Worse than that, you're competing with space when you bring back funny animals. They can do that too. Ra Chen scratched behind his ear. I never thought of that. You're right. But we've got to do something. There must be lots of things to do with a time machine. They could have taken a displacement plate back to the center. Ra Chen preferred to walk. It would give him a chance to think, he said. Svets walked with bowed head and blind eyes alongside his boss. Inspiration had come to him at similar times. But they had reached the red sandstone cube that was the center, and the mental lightning had not struck. A big hand closed on his upper arm. Just a minute, Ra Chen said softly. The Secretary General's paying us a visit. Svets's heart lurched. How do you know? You should recognize that machine in the walkway. We brought it back last month from Los Angeles, from the day of the Great California Earthquake. It's an internal combustion automobile. It belongs to the Secretary General. What'll we do? Go in and show him around. Pray he doesn't insist on being taken back to Watts, August 11th, 20 post-atomic. Suppose he does. If they boiled Ra Chen for treason, they would surely boil Svets, too. I'll have to send him back if he asks it. Oh, not with you, Svets. With Zira. She's black, and she speaks American. It might help. Not enough, said Svets, but he was already calmer. Let Zira take the risks. They passed close by the Secretary General's automobile. Svets was intrigued by its odd, angular look, its complex control panels, the shiny chrome trim. Someone had removed the hood so that the polished complexity of the motor was open to view. Wait, Svets said suddenly. Does he like it? Will you come on? Does the Secretary General like his automobile? Sure, Svets. He loves it. Get him another car. California must have been full of automobiles on the day before the Great Quake. Ra Chen stopped suddenly. That could be it. It would hold him for a while. Give us time. Time for what? Ra Chen didn't hear. A racing car? No, he'd kill himself. The Circle of Advisors would want to install a robot chauffeur override. Maybe a dune buggy. Why not ask him? It's worth a try, said Ra Chen. They went up the steps. In the center, there were three time machines, including the one with the big extension cage, plus a host of panels with flashing colored lights. The Secretary General liked those. He smiled and chuckled as Ra Chen led him about. His guards hovered at his shoulders, their faces stiff, their fingernails clicking against their gun butts. Ra Chen introduced Svets as my best agent. 
Svets was so overwhelmed by the honor that he could only stutter. But the Secretary General didn't seem to notice. Whether he had forgotten about seeing the Watts riot was moot, but he did forget to ask on that occasion. When Ra Chen asked about cars, the Secretary General smiled all across his face and nodded so vigorously that Svets worried about spinal injury. Faced by a vast array of choices, five or six decades with dozens of new models for every year, the Secretary General put his finger in his mouth and considered well. Then he made his choice. Why not ask him? Why not ask him? Rachen mimicked savagely. Now we know. The first car. He wants the first car ever made. I thought he'd ask for a make of car. Svets rubbed his eyes hard. How can we possibly find one car? A couple of decades to search through and all of the North American and European continents. It's not that bad. We'll use the books from the Beverly Hills Library. But it's bad enough, Svets. The raid on the Beverly Hills Library had been launched in full daylight, using the big extension cage and a dozen guards armed with stunners, on June 3rd, 26 post-atomic. Giant time machines, crazy men wearing flying belts. On any other day, it would have made every newspaper and television program in the country. But June the 3rd was a kind of happy hunting ground for the Institute for Temporal Research. No Californian would report the raid, except to other Californians. If the story did get out, it would be swamped by more important news. The series of quakes would begin at sunset, and the ocean would rise like a great green wall. Svets and Ra Chen and Zira Southworth spent half the night going through the history section of the Beverly Hills Library. Ra Chen knew enough white American to recognize titles, but in the end, Zira had to do all the reading. Zira Southworth was tall and slender and very dark, crowned with hair like a black powder explosion. She sat gracefully cross-legged on the floor, looking very angular, reading pertinent sections aloud while the others paced. They followed a twisting trail of references. By two in the morning, they were damp and furious. Nobody invented the automobile, Rachen exploded. It just happened. We certainly have a wide range of choices, Zira agreed. I take it we won't want any of the steam automobiles. That would eliminate Gounod and Trevithick and the later British steam coaches. We'll concentrate on internal combustion. Svet said, Our best bets seem to be Lenoir of France and Marcus of Vienna except that Daimler and Benz have good claims, and Selden's patent held good in court. Damn it, pick one! Just a minute, sir. Zira alone retained some semblance of calm. This Ford might be the best we've got. Ford? Why? He invented nothing but a system of mass production. Zira held up the book. Svets recognized it, a biography she had been reading earlier. This book implies that Ford was responsible for everything, that he created the automobile industry single-handed. But we know that isn't true, Svets protested. Ra Chen made a pushing motion with one hand. Let's not be hasty. We take Ford's car, and we produce that book to authenticate it. Who'll know the difference? But if someone does the same research, we just... Oh, sure, he'll get the same answers. No answers. Ford's just as good a choice as anyone else. Better if nobody looks further, Zira said with satisfaction. Too bad we can't take the Model T. It looks much more like an automobile. This thing he started with looks like a kitty cart. It says he built it out of old pipes. Tough, said Ra Chen. Later the next morning, Ra Chen delivered last-minute instructions. You can't just take the car, he told Zira. If you're interrupted, come back without it. Yes, sir. It would be less crucial if we took our duplicate from a later time, from the Smithsonian Institution, for instance. The automobile has to be new. Be reasonable, Zira. We can't give the Secretary General a second-hand automobile. No, sir. 
We'll land you about three in the morning. Use infrared and pills to change your vision. Don't show any visible light. Artificial light would probably scare them silly. Right. Were you shown? I know how to use the duplicator. Zira sounded faintly supercilious, as always. I also know that it reverses the image. Never mind that. Bring back the reverse duplicate, and we'll just reverse it again. Of course. She seemed chagrined that she had not seen that for herself. What about dialect? You speak black and white American, but it's for a later period. Don't use slang. Stick to black unless you want to impress someone white. Then speak white, but speak slowly and carefully, and use simple words. They'll think you're from another country. I hope. Zira nodded crisply. She stooped and entered the extension cage, turned, and pulled the duplicator after her. Its bulk was small, but it weighed a ton or so without the lift field generator to float it. One end glowed white with glow paint. They watched the extension cage blur and vanish. It was still attached to the rest of the time machine, but attached along a direction that did not transmit light. Now then, Rachen rubbed his hands together. I don't expect she'll have any trouble getting Henry Ford's flightless flight stick. Our trouble may come when the Secretary General sees what he's got. Svets nodded, remembering the gray and flat pictures in the history book. Ford's machine was ungainly, slipshod, ugly, and undependable. A few small, surreptitious additions would make it dependable enough to suit the Secretary General. Nothing would make it beautiful. We need another distraction, said Ra Chen. We've only bought ourselves more time to get it. Zira's small time machine gave off a sound of ripping cloth, subdued, monotonous, reassuring. A dozen workmen were readying the big extension cage. Zira would need it to transport the duplicate automobile. There's something I'd like to try, Svets ventured. Concerning what? The rock. Rachen grinned. The ostrich? Svets, don't you ever give up. Svets looked stubborn. Do you know anything about neoteny? Never heard of it. Look, Svets, we're going to be over budget because of the rock trip. Not your fault, of course, but another trip would cost us over a million commercials. I won't need the time machine. Oh? But I could use the help of the palace veterinarian. Have you got enough pull to arrange that? The palace veterinarian was a stocky, blocky, busty woman with muscular legs and a thrusting jaw. A floating platform packed with equipment followed her between the rows of cages. I know most of these beasts, she told Svets. Once upon a time, I was going to give them all names. An animal ought to have a name. They've got names. That's what I decided. Gila monster. Elephant. Ostrich, she read. You give Horace a name, so you won't mix him up with Gilbert. But nobody would get horse mixed up with elephant. There's only one of each. Poor beasties. She stopped before the cage marked Ostrich. Is this your prize? I've been meaning to come see him. The bird shifted its feet in indecision. It cocked its head to consider the couple on the other side of the glass. It seemed surprised at Svets's return. He looks just like a newly hatched chick, she said. Except for the legs and feet, of course. They seem to have developed to support the extra mass. Svets was edgy with the need to be in two places at once. His own suggestion had sparked Zira's project. He ought to be at the center. Yet, the ostrich had been his first failure. He asked, Does it look neotenous? Neotenous? Of course. Neoteny is a common method of evolution. We have neotenous traits ourselves, you know. Bare skin where all the other primates are covered with hair. When our ancestors started chasing their meat across the plains, they needed a better cooling system than most primates need, so they kept one aspect of immaturity, the bare skin. Probably the big head is another one. The axolotl is the classic example of neoteny. Excuse me? You know what a salamander was, don't you? It had gales and fins while immature. As an adult, it grew lungs and shed the gills and lived on land. 
The axolotl was a viable offshoot that never lost the gills and fins. A gene shift, typical of neoteny. I never heard of either of them, axolotls or salamanders. They needed open streams and ponds to live, Svets. Svets nodded. If they needed open water, then both species must be over a thousand years extinct. The problem is that we don't know when your bird lost its ability to fly. Some random neotenous development may have occurred far in the past, so that the bird's wings never developed. Then it may have evolved its present size to compensate. Oh, then the ancestor may have been no bigger than a turkey. Shall we go in and find out? The glass iris opened to admit them. Svets stepped into the cage, felt the tug of the pressure curtain flowing over and around him. The ostrich backed warily away. The vet opened a pouch on her floating platform, withdrew a stunner, and used it. The ostrich squawked in outrage and collapsed. No muss, no fuss. The vet strode toward her patient and stopped suddenly in the middle of the cage. She sniffed, sniffed again in horror. Have I lost my sense of smell? Svets produced two items like cellophane bags, handed her one. Put this on. Why? You might suffocate if you don't. He donned the other himself by pulling it over his head, then pressing the rim against the skin of his neck. It stuck. When he finished, he had a hermetic seal. The air is deadly, he explained. It's the air of the Earth's past, reconstituted. Think of it as coming from fifteen hundred years ago. There's no civilization. Nothing's been burned yet. That's why you can't smell anything but ostrich. Out there, well, you don't really need sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide and nitric oxides to stay alive. You do need carbon dioxide. There's a nerve complex in the lymph glands under your left armpit, and it triggers the breathing reflex. It's activated by a certain concentration of CO2 in the blood. She had finished donning her filter helmet. I take it the concentration is too low in here? Right. You'd forget to breathe. You're used to air that's 4% carbon dioxide. In here, it's barely a tenth of that. The bird can breathe this bland stuff. In fact, it'd die without it. What we've put into the air in the past 1,500 years, we've had 1,500 years to adapt to. The ostrich hasn't. I'll keep that in mind, she said shortly so that Svets wondered if he'd been lecturing someone who knew more than he did. She knelt beside the sleeping ostrich, and the platform floated lower for her convenience. Svets watched her as she ministered to the ostrich, taking tissue samples, testing blood pressure and heartbeat in reaction to small doses of hormones and drugs. In a general way, he knew what she was doing. There were techniques for reversing the most recent mutations in an animal's genetic makeup. One did not always get what one expected. Still, there was a homo habilis several cages down who had been in the circle of advisors until he called the secretary general a tyrannical fughead. While she was identifying the neotenous developments, she would also be trying to guess what she would have when they were eliminated. Then there were matters of metabolism. If Svets was right, the bird's mass would increase rapidly. It must be fed intravenously, and even more rapidly. In general, but the details of what she was doing were mysterious and dull. Svets found himself studying her filter helmet. Full inflation had rendered it almost invisible. A golden rim of it showed by diffraction against the yellow-brown sky. Did space really want to take over the Institute for Temporal Research? Then that golden halo was support for their claim. It was a semi-permeable membrane. It would selectively pass gases in both directions in such a way as to make an almost breathable atmosphere breathable. It had been taken unchanged from a space warehouse. Other ITR equipment had come from the space industries. Flight sticks, anesthetic needle guns, the low-mass anti-gravity unit in the new extension cage. But their basic argument was more subtle. Once, the ocean teemed with life, Svets thought. Now the continental shelf is as dead as the moon. 
nothing but bubble cities. Once this whole continent was all forest and living desert and fresh water. We cut down the trees and shot the animals and poisoned the rivers and irrigated the deserts so that even the desert life died. And now there's nothing left but the food yeast and us. We've forgotten so much about the past that we can't separate legend from fact. We've wiped out most of the forms of life on Earth in the last fifteen hundred years, and changed the composition of the air to the extent that we'd be afraid to change it back. I fear the unknown beasts of the past. I cannot breathe the air. I do not know the edible plants. I could not kill the animals for food. I do not know which would kill me. The Earth's past is as alien to me as another planet. Let space have it. The palace veterinarian was busy jabbing the pointed ends of color-coded tubing into various portions of the bird's anatomy. The tubes led back to machinery on the floating platform. Svetz's pocket phone rang. He flipped it open. There's trouble, said Rochen's image. Zira's cage was on its way home. She must have pulled the go-home lever right after she called for the big extension cage. She left before the big cage could get there? Ra Chen nodded grimly. Whatever happened must have happened fast. If she called for the big cage, then she had the automobile. A moment later, she aborted the mission. Svets, I'm worried. I'd hate to leave now, sir. Svets turned to look at the ostrich. In that moment, all of the bird's feathers fell out, leaving it plump and naked. That decided him. I can't leave now, sir. We'll have a full-grown rock here in another ten minutes. What? Good! But how? The ostrich was a neotenous offshoot of the rock. We've produced a throwback. Good! Stick with it, Svets. We'll handle it here. Ra Chen switched off. The palace veterinarian said, You shouldn't make promises you can't keep. Svets's heart leapt. Trouble? No, it's going beautifully so far. All the feathers fell out. Is that good? Don't worry about it. See for yourself. Already there's a coat of down. Your ostrich is reverting to chickhood, she said cheerfully. It's ancestor's chickhood. If the ancestor really was no bigger than a turkey before it lost the ability to fly, it'll be even smaller as a chick. What'll happen then? It'll drown in its own fat. We should have taken a clone. Too late. Look at it now. Look at the legs. They aren't nearly as overdeveloped. The bird was a big ball of pale yellow down. Its frame had shrunk, but its legs had shrunk much more. Standing, it would have been no more than four feet tall. The extra mass had turned to fat, so that the ostrich was nearly spherical. It bulged like a poolside toy lying on its inflated side in a pool of feathers. Now it really looks like a chick, said Svets. It does, Svets. In fact, it is. That was a big chick. The adult is going to be tremendous. The palace veterinarian jumped to her feet. Svets, we've got to hurry. Is there a basic dole yeast source in this cage? Sure, why? He'll starve at the rate he's growing unless... Just show me, Svets. The animals of the zoo ate dole yeast, like everyone else, but with special additives for each animal. A brain tap could induce the animal to imagine it was eating whatever it was used to eating when the time probe had picked it up. Svets showed her the yeast tap. She hooked the pipeline to one of the machines on her floating platform. She made adaptations, added another machine. The bird grew visibly. Its fat layer shrank, deflated. Its legs and wings stretched outward. The beak began to take a distinctive hooked form, sharp and wicked. Svets began to feel panic. Beneath its downy feathers, the bird was little more than taut skin stretched over long bones. The yeast was now feeding directly into two tanks on the floating platform, and from there into the colored tubes. Somehow the palace veterinarian was converting the yeast directly into sugar plasma. It's working now, she said. I wasn't sure it would. He'll be all right now if the growth cycle slows down in time. 
She smiled up at him. You were right all along. The ostrich was a neotenous rock. At that moment, the light changed. Svets wasn't sure what had disturbed him, but he looked up, and the sky was baby blue from the horizon to the zenith. What is it? The woman beside him was bemused rather than frightened. I never saw a color like that in my life. I have. What is it? Don't worry about it, but keep your filter helmet on, especially if you have to leave the cage. Can you remember that? Of course. Her eyes narrowed. You know something about this, Svets. It's something to do with time, isn't it? I think so. Svets used the key beam, then, to avoid further questions. The glass peeled back to let him out. He turned for a last look through the glass. The palace veterinarian looked frightened. She must have guessed too much for her own comfort. But she turned away to care for her patient. The ostrich lay on its side, its eyes open now. It was tremendous, and still scrawny despite the volume of the intravenous feed. Its feathers were changing color. The bird would be black and green. It was half as big as the elephant next door, whose air of gray wisdom was giving way to uneasiness as he watched the proceedings. It looked nothing like an ostrich. The sky was baby blue. The blue of the deep past, crossed with fluffy clouds of clean and shining white. Blue from the horizon to the zenith, without a trace of the additives that ought to be there. Unconscious men and women lay everywhere. Svets dared not stop to help. What he had to do was more important. He slowed to a walk as he neared the center. There was pain like a knife blade inserted between his partly healed ribs. ITR crewmen had fallen in the walkway around the center, presumably after staggering outside. And there was the Secretary General's automobile, sitting quietly in front. Behind it, flat on his back, was Ra Chen. What did he think he was doing there? Svets heard the purr of the motor as he approached. So that was it. Ra Chen must have hoped that the exhaust would revive him. Damn clever. And it should have worked. Why hadn't it? Svets looked into the polished metal guts of the motor as he passed. The motor had changed, somehow. What ran it now? Steam? Electricity? A flywheel? In any event, the exhaust pipe Ra Chen had been searching for was no longer there. Ra Chen was alive, his pulse rapid and frantic, but he wasn't breathing. Or... Yes, he was. He was breathing perhaps twice a minute, as carbon dioxide built up enough to activate the reflex. Svets went on into the center. More than a dozen men and women had collapsed across lighted control panels. Three more figures sprawled in an aisle. The Secretary General lay in angular disorder, smiling foolishly up at the ceiling. His guards wore troubled sleeping expressions and held drawn guns. The small extension cage had not returned. Svets looked into the empty gap in the time machine and felt terror. What could he accomplish without Zira to tell him what had gone wrong? From fifty anti-atomic to the present was a thirty-minute trip. Ra Chen's call to the zoo must have come less than thirty minutes ago. Weird how an emergency could telescope time. Unless that was a side effect of the paradox. Unless the paradox had chopped away Zira's extension cage and left her stranded in the past, or cast off into an alternate world line, or... There had never been a temporal paradox. Math was no help. The mathematics of time travel was riddled with singularities. Last year, somebody had tried to do a topological analysis of the path of an extension cage. He had proved not only that time travel was impossible, but that you couldn't travel faster than light either. Ra Chen had leaked the news to space on the off chance that their hyperdrive ships would stop working. What to do? Start putting filter helmets on everyone? Great, but the helmets weren't kept at the center. He'd have to go across town. Did he dare leave the center? Svets forced himself to sit down. Minutes later, he snapped alert at the pop of displaced air. 
the small extension cage had returned. Zira was crawling out of the circular doorway. Get back in there, Svets ordered. Quick! I don't take orders from you, Svets. She brushed past him and looked about her. The automobile's gone. Where's Rachen? Zira's face was blank with shock and exhaustion. Her voice was a monotone, ragged at the edges. Svets took her arm. Zira, weave. She jerked away. We've got to do something. The automobile's gone. Didn't you hear me? Did you hear me? Get back in the extension cage. But we've got to decide what to do. Why can't I smell anything? She sniffed at air that was scentless, empty, dead. She looked about her in bewilderment, realizing for the first time just how strange everything was. Then the eyes rolled up in her head, and Svets stepped forward to catch her. He studied her sleeping face across the diameter of the extension cage. It was very different from her waking face, softer, more vulnerable, and prettier. Zira had quite a pretty face. You should relax more often, he said. His ribs throbbed where the ostrich had kicked him. The pain seemed to beat like a heart. Zira opened her eyes. She asked, Why are we in here? The extension cage has its own air system, said Svets. You can't breathe the outside air. Why not? You tell me. Her eyes went wide. The automobile. It's gone. Why? I don't know. Svets, I swear, I did everything right. But when I turned on the duplicator, the automobile disappeared. That doesn't sound at all good. Svets strove to keep his voice level. What did you... I did it just the way they taught me. I hooked the glow-painted end to the frame, set the dials for an estimated mass plus a margin of error, read the dials off. You must have hooked up the wrong end somehow. Wait a minute. Were you using the infrared flash? Of course. It was dead of night. And you'd taken the pills so you'd be able to see infrared? Do you always think that slowly, Svets? Then her eyes changed. I was seeing infrared. Of course, I hooked up the hot end. The duplicator end. That would duplicate empty space where there was an automobile. You'd get emptiness at both ends. Stupid, Zira said bitterly. Stupid. She hooked her arms under her knees and relaxed against the curved side of the extension cage. Presently, she said, Henry Ford sold the automobile for two hundred dollars, according to the book. Later, he had trouble getting financed. How much is two hundred dollars? I think it depends on the year. Enough to ruin a man, apparently, if you take it away at the right time. Then someone else used assembly lines to make automobiles, and he must have liked steam or electricity. Steam, I guess. Steam cars came first. Why would that affect the air? We can breathe what comes out of an automobile exhaust pipe, but we don't need it to live, except CO2. A steam automobile would burn fuel, wouldn't it? I wondered about that, too, said Svets. It took me a while, but I got it. Some of what comes out of an exhaust pipe never goes away. It just stays in the air, like a curtain between us and the sun. It's been there for a thousand years, cutting off half our sunlight. And we made it didn't happen. Photosynthesis. That's where all the carbon dioxide went. Right. But if the air changed, why didn't we change with it? We evolved to be able to breathe a certain kind of air. Shouldn't the evolution have been cancelled too? For that matter, why do we remember? I don't know. There's a lot we don't know about time travel. I'm not nagging, Svets. I don't know either. More silence. It's clear enough, Zira said presently. I'll have to go back and warn myself to get the duplicator on straight. That won't work. It didn't work. If you'd gotten the ends of the duplicator on straight, we wouldn't be in this mess. Therefore, you didn't. Logic and time travel don't go, remember? Maybe we can go around you. Svets hesitated, then plunged in. Try this. Send me back to an hour before the earlier Zira arrives. The automobile won't have disappeared yet. I'll duplicate it, duplicate the duplicate, 
Take the reversed duplicate and the original past you in the big extension cage. That leaves you to destroy the duplicate. I reappear after you've gone, leave the original automobile for Ford, and come back here with the reverse duplicate. How's that? It sounded great. Would you mind going through it again? Let's see. I go back to... She was laughing at him. Never mind. But it has to be me, Svets. You couldn't find your way. You couldn't ask directions or read the street signs. You'll have to stay here and man the machinery. Svets was crawling out of the extension cage when there came a scream, like the end of the world. Momentarily, he froze. Then he dashed around the swelling flanks of the cage. Zira followed, wearing the filter helmet she had worn during her attempt to duplicate Ford's automobile. One wall of the center was glass. It framed a crest of hill across from the palace, and a double row of cages that made up the zoo. One of the cages was breaking apart as they watched, smashing itself to pieces like... like an egg hatching. And like a chick emerging, the rock stood up in the ruin of its cage. The scream came again. What is it? Zero whispered. It was an ostrich. I'd hate to give it a name now. The bird seemed to move in slow motion. There was so much of it. Green and black, beautiful and evil, big as eternity, and a crest of golden feathers had sprouted on its forehead. Its hooked beak descended toward a cage. That cage ripped like tissue paper. Zero was shaking his arm. Come on! If it came from the zoo, we don't need to worry about it. It'll suffocate when we get the car back where it belongs. Oh, right, said Svets. They went to work moving the big extension cage a few hours further back in time. When Svets looked again, the bird was just taking to the air. Its wings flapped like sails, and their black shadows swept like clouds over the houses. As the rock rose fully into view, Svets saw that something writhed and struggled in its tremendous talons. Svets recognized it and realized just how big the rock really was. It's got elephant, he said. An inexplicable sorrow gripped his heart. Inexplicable, for Svets hated animals. What? Come on, Svets! Um, oh, yes. He helped Zira into the small extension cage and sent it on its way. Despite its sleeping crew, the machinery of the center was working perfectly. If anything got off, Svets would have six men's work to do. Therefore, he prowled among the control boards, alert for any discrepancy, making minor adjustments, and occasionally he looked out the picture window. The rock had reached an enormous height. Any other bird would have been invisible long since, but the rock was all too apparent, hovering in the blue alien sky while it killed and ate elephant. Bloody bones fell in the walkway. Time passed. Twenty minutes for Zira to get back. More time to make two duplicates of the automobile, load them into the big extension cage, then to signal Svets. The signal came. She had the cars. Svets played it safe, moved her forward six hours, almost to dawn on the crucial night. She might be caught by an early riser, but at least Ford would have his automobile back. The rock had finished its bloody meal. Elephant was gone, and, Svets watched until he was sure, the bird was dropping, riding down the sky on outstretched wings. Svets watched it grow bigger and bigger yet until it seemed to enfold the universe. It settled over the center like a tornado cloud in darkness and wind. Like twin tornado funnels, two sets of curved talons touched down in the walkway. The bird bent low. An inhuman face looked in at Svets through the picture window. It nearly filled the window. It knows me, Svets thought. Even a bird's brain must be intelligent in a head that size. The vast head rose out of sight above the roof. I had the ostrich. I should have been satisfied, thought Svets. A coin in the hand is worth two in the street. The ancient proverb could as easily be applied to birds.
The roof exploded downward among a tremendous hooked beak. Particles of concrete spattered against walls and floor. A yellow eye rolled and found Svets, but the beak couldn't reach him. Not through that hole. The head withdrew through the roof. Three red lights. Svets leapt for the board and began twisting dials. He made two lights turn green, then the third. It had not occurred to him to run. The bird would find him out wherever he hid. There, Zira had pulled the go-home lever. From here, it was all automatic. Crash! Svets was backed up against the big time machine, pinned by a yellow eye as big as himself. Half the roof was gone now. Still, the curved beak couldn't reach him. But a great claw came seeking him through the shattered glass. The light changed. Svets sagged. Behind the green and black feathers, he could see that the sky had turned pale yellow-green, marked with yellow-brown streamers of cloud. The bird sniffed, incredulously, once, twice. Somehow the panic showed in its tremendous eye, before the great head rose through the roof. The rock stepped back from the center for clearance. Its dark wings swept down like night falling. Svets was beyond fear or common sense. He stepped out to watch it rise. He had to hug an ornamental pillar. The wind of the wings was a hurricane. The bird looked down once, recognized him, and looked away. It was still well in view, rising and circling, when Zira stepped out to join him. Presently, Ra Chen was there to follow their eyes. Then, half the center maintenance team was gaping up in awe and astonishment. The bird dwindled to a black shadow. Black against pastel green, climbing, climbing, suffocating. One sniff had been enough. The bird's brain was as enormously proportioned as the rest of it. It had started climbing immediately, without waiting to snatch up Svets for its dessert. Climbing, climbing toward the edge of space, reaching for clean air. The Secretary General stood beside Svets smiling in wonder, chuckling happily as he gazed upward. Was the rock still climbing? No. The black shadow was growing larger, sliding down the sky, and the slow motion of the wings had stopped. How was a rock to know that there was no clean air anywhere?